The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. My name is Amanda Puentes, and I am honored to be district director for a council member, for newly elected council member Pierina Sanchez. Um, and so thank you so much. If you were invited tonight, it's because you are um, a resident, you are one of our constituents, you are a leader, you are a community stakeholder, you mean something to District 14. And it is so important that you are on tonight and that we hear your voice. So we are going to get started um, for tonight's uh, meeting. Um, again, so my name is Amanda Puentes. I am the district director um, for newly elected council member, council member Pierina Sanchez. We, uh, again, we're so excited uh, to be here tonight. For the first time ever, uh, District 14 is engaging. We are announcing um, a capital uh, budget. Um, and this is the first time that we are engaging in um, the, partic the participatory budget that we like to call the people's money. And so um, tonight to share exactly what participatory budgeting is, we have our newly elected member, Pierina Ana Sanchez on the line with us. But before we get started, um, it's important that we can just, you know, talk about some community agreements. And so the first thing is that we want to ensure that everybody keeps their mic muted. Uh, we are going to have a time for question and answering at the end. Um, please add your name, your the neighborhood that you represent, and your email address to the chat box. We will be engaging in a chat box. Our chief of staff, Sam, will actually be um, just, just managing the chat box. So if you add anything, um, just know that it's not being overlooked. Uh, we are all here with a common commitment to this district. And so we welcome all feedback. Um, again, Sam is going to be taking over the, the comment box. Uh, so feel free to add anything, questions, concerns. Um, and so we are looking forward to seeing that engagement. Um, but to get started for tonight, um, we are, again, this is the first time that we are doing this in District 14. So this is a big deal. I don't know if you can feel my excitement over the, the screen, but this is a big deal. And we, um, it's a pleasure to be able to um, share what this is and be able to hear the voice of District 14. So to get started, um, we are going to welcome Council Member Sanchez to take the stage and take over uh, for the rest of our evening. All right, all right. Uh, can everybody hear me and see me okay? Just a thumbs up uh, virtual or with your actual thumbs. Thank you, thank you so much. Well, everyone, thank you so much for being on tonight. As Amanda has said, by the way, welcome Amanda to the team. Uh, just a, a week and some change in, maybe two weeks at this point. Uh, very excited to be building. Um, I took office on January 1st after the elections that happened last year. And I'm just so excited to, to be bringing collective and community governance into our community to make sure that you all have your voice heard. Uh, but before we start today um, with the presentation, I did want to take uh, just a moment of silence uh, to uh, pay our respects uh, to police officer Jason Rivera, who tragically lost his life uh, but a few days ago, to pray also for Officer Wilbert Mora, who is also fighting for his life in the hospital as we speak. 
and to pray for the victims of the fire, the tragic fire that occurred only two weeks ago at 333 uh, East 181st Street, uh, just, just down the street from District 14, and so many other things that our community is going through. So I'm just going to ask us uh, to take just, a, just about a minute to, to think and reflect for, for a moment and to pray for all of these things happening in our community. Thank you so much. And so with that, you know, I, I want I want you all to know that more than ever, we are here, we are united as District 14, as a, a part of the city of New York, as a part of the fabric of the city of New York, and we are one. And our city and our community is going through difficult moments. But just as we always have, we will rise from the ashes and, and we're going to recover and we're going to do that together. And that is that is actually why. And, and you all, you know me, right? I, I work so hard to bring positivity, to bring light into uh, the, the difficult situations that we always that we we find ourselves in and here here in the community and, and throughout the city. And this, that to me is what participatory budgeting is, right? We are bringing the government to the people. We are saying Pierina as a city council member who represents 160,000 plus uh, residents in the community of District 14. Uh, I, you all have entrusted me with decision-making power. You all have entrusted me with uh, a part, being a part of the, of the decision-making process that decides how billions and billions of dollars are spent in the city of New York, how, what projects are prioritized, uh, what groups can receive funding, what initiatives the city of New York is going to undertake. And yet, as a part of that process, as a part of that process, our voices, your voices, need to be centered. And so you know that my philosophy is that anything that I know, you can know, right? It's a matter of sharing information and sharing in that decision-making process. And so participatory budgeting really is about making sure that everything and anything that I know, I'm sharing with you. And what better way to do that than putting putting my money, our money, where our mouths are, and making sure that you have a voice in that process. Now, I'm just going to pause for a second here and ask if there is anyone on the Zoom um, who needs uh, translation into Spanish. I can do that live. I, can, I cannot do other languages, although we're going to do outreach in, in as many languages as possible. I quiero tomar un momento para preguntar si hay alguien que necesita eh, traducción al, al español en vivo eh, en este momento durante el Zoom. So pueden alzar su mano o pueden eh, salir en la cámara y enseñar sus manos. Okay. If at any moment um, that becomes clear, I can begin to translate. Um, I also, uh, we can also offer this uh, same training in Spanish at a later time. All right. So with that, um, the last thing I want to do as a part of housekeeping is I want you all to, to know that we are live streaming on Facebook. So there are folks who are with us on Facebook, not on the Zoom. And uh, thank you so much to BronxNet who is live streaming this and this will be on uh, TV as well. So thank you so much, BronxNet. Next slide. Okay, so what is participatory budgeting? So participatory budgeting is all about making, making sure that the community has a voice in the way that government resources are spent. So as a city council member, I have a, a small amount uh, of discretion in how some of the city budget is used. 
the city's budget is divided into what is called capital funding and programmatic or expense funding. So capital funding we is what we will be talking about tonight. And expense funding, programmatic funding, is actually uh, the kinds of funds that you use to run programs, uh, to pay staff, to keep your lights on, that you use to run programs, uh, to pay staff, to keep your lights on if you have a nonprofit. So I want to distinguish those two. And so in participatory budgeting, the, 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 the people have a role in saying what the government is going to do with our money. Participatory budget, budgeting plays an important role in giving communities the ability to directly impact the capital budgeting process. It motivates New Yorkers, y'all, Bronxites, to engage in the civic process and make decisions by sharing your ideas, helping us to develop the proposals and voting on community projects. Since 2011, when participatory budgeting first started, it has strengthened communities across the city and made us stronger. And this is the very first time, as Amanda has said, that we are doing this in District 14. So I'm going to provide a small, a short overview of how this will work. And the idea is that I would love for the community, for you, my neighbors, some of you are almost across the street. I'm going to wave at you, Miss Carrie. I'm right across the street from you. Um, so, so the idea is that the neighbors walk away knowing what are what is allowed to be funded. And what are our limitations, right? What can we fund and what we cannot fund with city taxpayer dollars? Next slide. Okay. Um, I think the principal slide, Amanda. Okay, wonderful. So just to lay out a few of the principles of participatory budgeting. So first, empowerment. Uh, we want to ensure that the decision-making process is accessible to every single person in the neighborhood and that spending decisions are made to benefit the highest needs in our community. Transparency. Uh, we're sharing information and making decisions as openly as possible. So we'll talk about it, but you'll see that all of the ideas for this $1 million is going to come from the community. And as we, um, we narrow down on all of those ideas that came in, what is actually eligible for funding, it is also then the community that is going to decide uh, what we will fund. Equity, we wanna ensure that the decision-making process is accessible to every single person and that spending decisions most benefit our community. And lastly, community. Right? We want to bring people together across traditional lines of division, and we want to work together for the good of all, all of us. Next slide. Great. So what is the capital budget? So the capital budget pays for things for the city of New York that will last a long time and give larger benefits to the city uh, that, that last beyond, beyond the time of purchase. So some examples are a playground, uh, so renovation of a playground, building a playground, requesting, um, requesting repairs to roads or sidewalks, um, adding new trees, uh, fixing up our step streets, for example, that we have in District 14. So you can think of uh, items that are in the capital budget like things that our households often borrow to pay for an initial purchase, right? They're big and they're expensive. And that's why I wanna give you the power to decide uh, what those expenditures are. Next slide. Okay, so we already gave a few examples, but you know, this, uh, uh, just a few others to, to paint them in our minds. Um, you can fund capital expenses in, uh, in education, so upgrades to our schools. We can think about our cultural institutions, uh, our parks, and our streets and our transit. Okay, so when we talk about the $1 million uh, that we're, we're spending, uh, still on the last slide, um, when we talk about the $1 million, we want to make sure that you have the right frame of reference uh, when you start proposing the idea. So next slide. Okay, so there's going to be a test for any proposal that you make, um, and it's a three-part test. So first is what is the cost? So the cost has to be at least 
$50,000. And that's because of economies of scale. The city needs it to be a big enough project that you can allocate uh, that much funding for. Number two, it has to have a quote, useful life of at least five years. And so what that means is that the expenditure will, will work, it will be good, it will, it will still be around five years from now, right? So something that is gonna only last two years wouldn't be eligible. And the third piece of it, it has, is that it has to involve the construction or reconstruction, acquisition, or installation of a physical public improvement. Next slide. Um, okay, so then we're, we're going to give um, so, some examples of definitely fundable, um, maybe depends on the details, and definitely not eligible. So projects must, form, must serve a public purpose. Uh, you know right away that a project will likely be eligible for funding if it is directly owned by the city. So it is owned by the Department of Parks and Recreation. For example, a community garden is owned and controlled by the Department of Parks and Recreation, uh, right? It's owned by the Department of Education. So these, uh, these entities or these places, these assets that are owned by the city, the city can, of course, improve them through the capital funding process. Maybe. So we start to get into gray territory when the owner is a nonprofit organization, right? So then you have a test of whether that nonprofit organization has a relationship with the city. So when the city funds a capital project, it's you kind of you don't want to think about it as a grant to that organization. You kind of want to think about it as a contract with the with the city of New York to provide a service through physical assets, right? So let's say it's a nonprofit, it's a healthcare institution that serves a lot of Medicaid and Medicare patients. So if they want to do an improvement, they might qualify because they're a nonprofit and they're serving the public through their Medicaid and Medicare population especially. Finally, what is definitely, definitely not eligible? Private property, religious organizations, uh, a co-op, um, any, anything that is for a private individual. So for instance, um, I've heard suggestions that we should fund you know, improvements to all of the awnings on Fordham Road so that they can be uniform. That is a wonderful idea. However, New York City taxpayer dollars, your dollars that you pay from your paychecks cannot be used to improve private property that benefits a private owner. It has to be for the benefit of the public. Next slide. So you start to get into tricky territory um, because there, there's a lot of projects here that fall in the gray, gray area. So for example, what about preventative maintenance? What about if we're talking about painting or carpet cleaning, um, or maybe we wanna do a small renovation for an office? You wanna, whenever you have these questions about gray areas, we wanna run through that three-part test. Does it cost more than $50,000? Is it for public purpose, right? So you wanna ask the, those three questions to help you arrive at whether or not uh, this can be funded by the city of New York. And the important thing here is, folks, that this is this is the 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 way I have to make decisions too, right? I can't just fund anything. I can't even even outside of the the money that is in my discretion. When we're talking about the full budget of the city of New York, which is upwards of ninety billion dollars in previous year years, we're still talking about that the city of New York taxpayer dollars cannot go for those private improvements. Next slide. So we're almost wrapping up here. Just wanted to give everybody a good sense of what we have. So what is next? What follows? Um, we are on a very, very, very accelerated timeline for participatory budgeting this year. Um, typically, you know, New York City uh, passes the budget in June, uh, June 30th of 2021 was last year. And then right there on July 1st, you can start uh, engaging in participatory budgeting. And then when we get right around to this time is when we have to wrap it up and start to test our projects to make sure we know exactly what we're going to try to put in the budget. And so this year, since I've just taken office um, and I'm, I'm only starting, um, we're, we're on a condensed timeline, but the idea is that we're gonna do this every year, right? And that we're gonna learn, we're gonna use this opportunity as a sort of abridged um, 
participatory budgeting process. And from here, next year, we will have a much, uh, a much elongated period of time for engagement. So um, we will be able to take ideas. Our uh, District 14 Council Office will be able to take ideas from the public until this Saturday, January 29th. Um, please get your ideas in. I'm sorry, no, we, we will be able to take them until Sunday night. Uh, I believe it's January 30th. And so please get your ideas in. Uh, we will share in the chat, we've shared it in this presentation, uh, where you can uh, submit your ideas, you can submit them online, um, or you can join us on the streets on Wednesday, January 26th, we'll be handing out flyers to our neighbors and, and just taking ideas on the ground uh, at our subway stations. So we'll be posting about that and let you know where we are. Um, on Saturday, January 29th, we will also uh, be out in the street and engaging with neighbors. We'll also have COVID-19 testing kits for any families who need those. Um, so tell your friends, um, tell everyone to, to come and join us and really to share their ideas for the neighborhood. Next slide. And with that, the end goal is to, to make our neighborhood better, to make our neighborhood more beautiful. But in the process, I, I want you all to know what I know, learn what I am learning as a city council member, what I have learned over the years, so that you all and we together can be stronger advocates for the community. Okay, so the next piece of the conversation um, is actually going to be the question and answer period. So we are going to start it off. I want to thank so much uh, to some of our community leaders who uh, who I reached out to, we reached out to, and they volunteered and they said, yes, of course, we'll, we'll participate. Uh, so we're going to start with them uh, on questions, clarifying questions or ideas that they want to sort of workshop together. And then we'll open it up to, to folks uh, who are on the Zoom more broadly. All right, so with that, I think we can stop sharing screen. Um, and Chef, uh, 30 second warning that I will go to you first. All right. Okay. All right. So Chef, going to you first, what are your thoughts? Uh, do you have any ideas or clarifying questions? Um. I, I had some ideas because um, in our areas, it's, it's like where it's so dark. And when people are going like off the subway or, you know, in their travels, it's like, it's so dark. And is there a way that we can like, is does it fit in what you're asking? Can we get light bulbs that are right? So that, you know, with the crime that happens, it's like they can't see the person because it's blurry. You know, the, the, this ain't too good. So it's, to me, it's all about lighting. It's like we come up from the stairs of the subway, we can't see when we're leaving at five o'clock in the morning, you know, it's like so dark. So I, I really feel, you know, that there's parts in within our district that we can improve on that. Is that possible? Absolutely. So that's that's a great that's a great suggestion, Chef. Um, so I'm actually going to make sure that Amanda, uh, who is our district director, and Samantha or Sam, who is our chief of staff, uh, they're also going to pinch hit with me here. I might not have all the answers, but they may know, and we're all doing this together. Um, but yes, Chef. So what you're talking about, you know, let's think about that three step test. And I'm going to pull, pull up my notes so that so that I do it in order of how I said before. So one is the cost at least fifty thousand dollars. So what you want to do when you're proposing um, an investment or an idea for for a capital improvement like that is you want to get specific. Um, you know, lighting where right. So let's say we're talking about, I see Victor Saldana on the call. So let's say we're talking about Cedar Avenue. Cedar Avenue is pretty dark or Sedgwick, right? It's pretty dark. We want to get lighting there. So when you go onto the application, you want to say between Fordham Road and Burnside, we want to see lighting, right? And then the next step after that is the vetting process. And the vetting process is when the city tells us, actually, that that seems feasible. That's possible. We're we're looking at a cost of five hundred thousand dollars, or we're looking at a cost of fifty thousand dollars, whatever the case may be, right? So we're going to propose all the ideas, and then the city comes back to us with a cost, and then the community has to say, "Hey, we have a million dollars. How are we going to spend it?" But absolutely, that is a capital improvement, and we can be specific. It costs uh, fifty thousand dollars. The useful life would be more than five years. You would hope that the lights don't go out. 
Um, and then the third piece of the test, is it a physical improvement? Yes. Okay. Excellent. Okay, so now uh, the next person is going to be Toby. And then Mr. Kwame, you are next. And then Maria, you, you'll be after that. And then we'll open it up to um, everyone. So Ms. Toby, uh, do, you, do you have a, any questions or suggestions? I don't think we have Toby on. I think she might have jumped off if we want to okay. circle back with her. Not a problem. All right, Mr. Kwame Whitaker, uh, do you want to... Oh, and I should say, um, can you can you mention the neighborhood you live in when you when you introduce yourself? So, Mr. Whitaker, can you share? Mute. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Good. Um, yes, I'm Kwame Whitaker, and I live in the University Heights portion of the Bronx, right here next to Bronx Community College. And I've lived here for quite some time. Um, I do have a few uh, suggestions. Uh, maybe I'll just uh, start with the thing. Well, well, I'll start with one. I did suggest pollinator gardens at the tree bases um, because that would help to uh, increase the volume of pollinators, which are so important to our food source. And it might prevent some of the dog walkers from allowing their dogs to uh, relieve themselves at the base of the tree, which causes the trees to die. My thinking is there would have to be some sort of ornamental fencing around the perimeter of the base. Um, that's just one small idea. But on another level, as you were talking, I realized that um, there may be actually more money to spend than I realize, perhaps. So. My suggestion would be, yeah, right, musical programs in the schools, music programs. Um, myself being a person who's very much involved with music, I play percussion and I have for years. Um, I know that music helps to stimulate the thinking process of growing minds. The, the child or the, the student doesn't necessarily have to become a professional musician, but just the the impact and the effect of learning how to play something where you have to focus on learning to read notes, paying attention to directions, et cetera, et cetera, work in accordance with a, a group of people. It's, it's, it's very effective to getting minds improved. Um, there used to be music programs in school. I know I was part of a, a band when I was in school, younger days. Um, so that, that, that I thought would be something that um, might be perhaps be able to be implemented. Um, another thing, which I'm just going to hit on quickly, recycling composted waste, recycling waste that basically uh, veg vegetable matter, food waste, not certain things are not permitted, but I know we all throw our garbage out and we're supposed to be recycling, although that's something that needs to be strengthened in my opinion in this area uh, getting trying to get people to take the the, the products the plantain peels the the, the par parts of vegetables that you don't use and put them in a composting sort of container which the city has some program like that already and that container that that waste matter would be collected and used to compost the soil and it's used to grow grow the flora in the parks, et cetera. That's um, something I thought of. And getting back to the schools for a minute, how about classes for computer coding? Coding is gonna be an essential element to learn, not only for children, but for adults. So I thought perhaps maybe the schools could institute a program on weekends or after school with the children and, and those adults who are perhaps interested could get involved in learning how to code. Um, that would be a great thing because you can, I mean, we're in a technological age and coding allows you to really participate in that technology. I have a lot of other suggestions, but I don't, I don't wanna monopolize the, uh, the, um, the discussion. 
So I'll, I'll leave it at that and we can come back to, to some of them later, if that's okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love it. I love it. This is what it's, this is what it's all about. Um, so I will, I'll take the, I'll take two of them and I think Amanda can take the other two. So I'll take pollinated gardens at, actually I'll take pollinated gardens, music programs. Hmm. You know what? I'm going to go in order and I'll turn it to Amanda <laughs> at certain points. Um, okay. okay. So, so again, there's, there's the, the two different ways that the city thinks about funding uh, organizations and activities and investments in communities, right? There's capital and then there's expense, right? So when we're talking about capital, which is what this, um, this participatory budgeting cycle focuses on, uh, we want to ask that three-part test question, right? The, the, three, the, three, uh, the three questions. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, again, pull up my cheat sheet because that way I don't miss anything, um, there we go. Okay. So pollinated gardens, um, does it cost at least $50,000? Um, so it sounds like you're talking about ornamental fencing around our tree pits, right? To, to, uh, beautify yeah, yeah. our, our, our streetscapes. As, as well as if I can just cut you off, sorry, as well mm -hmm. as planting the flowers that, that attract the bees and the butterflies, which are the principal pollinators. Okay. So so putting up the ornaments and planting the flowers. So exactly. a question you always want to ask is who is going to do the work, right? Good who question. is going to actually do it? So if the answer is the city would do it, this is something that they already do um, with, with the funding that we provide, uh, they, you know, it would be a part of the capital improvement work, then we're good. If it starts to get into, well, you know, maybe it could be this neighborhood group, or maybe it could be volunteer, or maybe it could be someone else. Now we're talking about programmatic funding, right? So different, different set of rules, different set of considerations. Doesn't mean we can't do it, um, but we just can't do it through the capital process. It's a part of a different conversation. And next year when we have our different cycle, you know, my my full plan and intention is to to mix it up so that we can also be learning and talking about expense um but but this uh the pollinated gardens is kind of a mixed bag so on the improvements and the you know the ornamenting i think that you can get up to fifty thousand dollars which is the first test two does it have a useful life of five years i think it can um three is it a physical public improvement yes but when it gets to the planting of the flowers and who is doing that work that's where it might be programmatic and so we would have to ask that question to the city agency um, and see if we can include it in the capital or if it's a different conversation on uh, programmatic. When you talk about recycled uh, compost, composted waste, uh, fortunately for us, there is a citywide composting program. Um, it was paused during COVID-19. Uh, it was a pilot program then, uh, but now it's it's being picked back up. And so that's not something that we need to take out of our District 14 funding to do, but it is something that I need to, for example, as your city council member with community board, with the support of the community, um, make sure to ask the Department of Sanitation, hey, we need these brown bins in our community. We don't have enough of them. We want to participate in this program, right? So that's a whole nother category, which is what I love about participatory budgeting is I get to share with all of you, you know, how the different pieces move and, and where they fit together. And so for musical programs and for classes on computer coding, I'm going to turn that over to Amanda. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, the, the slideshow was amazing. The presentation was so good. And uh, we've been learning so much about this. So um, I'm, I'm so happy that we're here to answer some of these questions and kind of go over these ideas. So uh, these were great ideas, um, Mr. Whitaker. So in regards to the student projects, the school projects, very similar to what the council member was just saying, th these projects would be considered programmatic. So uh, if we go back to our cheat sheet, right, does it cost at least $50,000? $50,000, depending on technology, depending on what we may need, maybe um, instruments, maybe new computers, um, maybe, right? The technology um, and the instruments may cost up to that. Does it have a useful life of at least five years? Yes, but here where here is where it gets tricky. The money would have to be allocated on a yearly basis. So the money that we would be allocating, well, that the council would be allocating for um, the capital project, 
it has to be a one-time thing. And so if we are discussing programs in schools, this is something that would be repeated on a yearly basis. So unfortunately, something like that will not be considered a capital expense. But just like the council member said, there are other uh, budgets and there are other things that we can be able to work around. And so we hear you. Uh, this is also a priority uh, to this office and to the council member um, investing in schools in our youth in our students. So although this may not qualify for capital expense, um, we can also talk more about this down the line. So this particular project, it would not be qualified for, unfortunately. Oh, I see. Perfect. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, okay. And, and I also want to highlight that we have Ms. Nieves on the line, Mr. Kwame. Ms. Nieves is not only the, the a parent association leader in her child's middle school, but she's also the leader for District 10 uh, in all of our schools in, in a, a community uh, education, District 10. And so we have such a wonderful participation tonight. And like Amanda said, um, we're going we're gonna to make it you know, we're going to have a great time with a million dollars and we're going to be, you know, allocating that together as a community, but that our advocacy will not stop there. Um, and you, you know, you know, Mr. Whitaker, uh, that we're, we're going to continue fighting for our underfunded, our schools are underfunded, right? Our, there, there is long, it's just long overdue how much we need. Um, so we're going to do that in partnership together. And, you know, it, it starts here. It starts building with us, building relationships with one another um, or strengthening them where, where you already know each other. So I'm going to turn to Ms. Toby, and then Maria, you will be right after that. Ms. Toby? Yes, I'm here. So I understand the process of the participatory budgeting, and thank you for the PowerPoint. So what, I'm, what I would like to see happen is I would like to see Indivo Park, um, Hopscotch put back down, as well as Skelsies put back down. It might not be a big ticket item, but it's something that will provide the children of all ages some um, positive opportunities to, um, to engage in, in while they're in the park outside of the basketball. Okay. Also, uh, in and around, in, around the Vaux Park, um, Tara and I, we did a walkthrough and we noticed that there's 42 trees that are surround the Vaux Park, including in the Vaux Park. It's a total of 42, but there are missing trees. And we would like for those trees to be added back. And we would also like to see those trees protected by guards by um, fencing. Um, and I think that those items meet the participatory budget um, guidelines. So excellent. Yes. Yay. <laughs> yes. No, Miss Toby, these are these are wonderful ideas. Um, so on on hopscotch, I'm trying to I'm trying to envision what it is. Right. Because we, we do this together. Right. So if we're talking about paint on the ground, that's a pretty that's relatively low, um, low, not risk, but it's like low effort, you know, relatively speaking, you know, compared to some of the other kind of things that we want to see in the community. I don't know if it would rise to $50,000, um, but we can certainly ask the question. Um, and then yes, uh, on the trees surrounding the park, um, adding the fencing, you know, filling in the, the, the missing trees. Um, first, there's a, there's a city parks initiative that requires a certain number of trees uh, to be on, on a block. You know, it's the million trees initiative for, for many years ago. And so these are both ideas that, that would uh, potentially qualify and we should absolutely submit. The important thing, uh, Ms. Toby, which is which you are great and, and you you told us exactly where, is to be specific about the location, right? So if it's uh, in the perimeter of DeVoe Park, just to you know clearly say that in the in the form, so that okay. when the city agencies are vetting our projects, they know exactly where we're talking about. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you. All right, uh, Ms. Nieves. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Maria. 
which are lowest near west, as many of you guys uh, may know me. Um, as Pirina said, as council member Pirina Sanchez, gotta clarify that. Um, I am a parent, a leader, and a community advocate in District 10, more specifically for um, our children's schools and education. So I do have a few ideas that I wanted to share. Um, so many of our schools are overcapped, overpopulated, and we already know that. Um, many of our schools have special education classes, and those classes should be at a lower level. And unfortunately, many of those are in the top floors of our schools. So maybe considering creating annexes for those certain schools that do need the space to be able to provide the services to the special, to special needs children, um, which are also included in D75 school. So there's different things that we gotta look at. We have to take a look at the school, the special education programs that they have, but then we can't forget also the D75. Right, majority of the kids have the students have special needs. Um, the school may not have an elevator, so that may be another thing to also consider. The reason why an annex will be um, easier for them to be on instead of having to go through the hallway with all the other the other classes um, just to get to their class at the top floor. Um, another thing that I also wanted to mention specifically in District Ten is that. Many of the schools need upgrades. What do I mean by upgrades? Um, some don't have auditoriums. Some need to upgrade their auditoriums. Um, some still have the cafeteria, but there's others that want the cafeteria, but they want a better kitchen. Why do they want a new kitchen in the cafeteria? Because they're tired of providing the same lunches, the warm-up lunches to the students. We talk about healthy eating. But why do we talk about healthy eating when we're not providing the foods that our students need and we're just warming it up? And it's the same thing over and over. And it's not healthy. And it's either full of sugar or full of salt. So maybe rejoin some kitchens and some schools where they have the space as well as the staff to be able to provide it. Um, also some gyms, some, some schools share their gyms. And some schools even have a gym that is also part of a cafeteria. Um, and then playgrounds. Those are necessary for the, the activities, you know, doing physical education. Um, we talk about healthy eating and it also goes with PE, physical education. So we wanna make sure that our students are healthy. So these are some of the ideas that I wanted to bring up. And one last one, it will be community garden. A lot of our kids now, what did they do while they were home during the pandemic? Parents got either a little plant or something to take care of because they gave them hope. They were able to see when there were just seeds and how they grew. That old not only teaches them how to be, how to take care of something the same way we parents do with our kids. We took care of them when they were little and we saw them grow and we fed them. So this will be the same thing with the students. The students will put their efforts and it will also help out mentally and physically and emotionally because they're gonna, they could relate to something that they created on their own. And those would just be my ideas. Thank you for the time. Excellent, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Nieves. I really appreciate that. Um, so, so to talk about a, a couple of the examples that you gave. So our schools are overcrowded, uh, District 75 students, deserve uh, deserve accommodations that are not what they're getting in the schools right now. So what we would do is we would uh, talk talk about that with the school construction authority. Um, again, you know, any time that we're talking about this, we have to be as specific as possible. So for example, you know, if there's two schools, three schools, four out of the 20 that we have, you know, what the specific schools, knowing where they are, um, and specifically what improvements we're asking for at each one, that helps us to have more, more successful proposals with uh, the school construction authority. Um, what I would say, uh, you know, just realistically, right, and that's, that's, this is when you all, can, can feel my pain is 
the scale of budget that we're talking about when we're talking about accessibility improvements, when we're talking about new entrances um, or a new building, $100 million, $200 million easily, right? And we're talking about a $1 million for participatory budgeting. Again, that does not mean we do not fight for it. That does not mean that we do not ask for it. You know, the, the purpose for me personally, one of the biggest reasons we do participatory budgeting is so that we as a community can know together right we we can know and understand these processes together and that makes us stronger in our advocacy so we can submit these ideas and we should and absolutely should uh, submit these ideas to to the school construction authority because they meet the three-part test minimum fifty thousand, uh useful life of, of five years or more and a physical improvements uh, but when we when we get that information back th those assessments back uh, we will get that understanding together of how how much these things cost, right? And make those decisions as a community together. Um, everything else you said, auditoriums, redoing kitchens, gyms, playgrounds, all of those are squarely into in the realm of uh, items that can be in participatory budgeting and the community can, you know, um, allocate funding to. And in, in the community garden example, um, my clarification or my clarifying question would be um, what what is what is it that we're asking for the funding for? So, for example, we actually have um, shout out to Miss Carey. Uh, we have one of our presidents of a community garden in, the, in here in the neighborhood. It's it's right on 181st um, and Morris. Hey, Miss Miss Carey. Um, so, for instance, if, if we were trying to redo the, the tree beds or if we were trying to, you know, create a ramp where there are stairs, you know, those those are the kind of improvements that fall under the capital budget. Um, but again, if we're talking about seeds or we're talking about programming, you know, we're talking about a program that teaches the kids how to do this. Those are programmatic funds um, and and don't fall within capital. Does that make sense? Yeah. But again, these are all conversations that we can have. Um, okay, so those are those are the the, the first set of folks that um, had volunteered uh, after we asked them to, <laughs> uh, to to come with questions. Thank you so much. Um, and now I just want to open it. Uh, we have about uh, 10 minutes remaining for, for the call. We want to uh, be respectful of everybody's time and just so appreciate you all. Uh, but I want to open up the floor and I see two hands. Um, Victor Saldana, why don't we go to you first and then we'll go to Iverca and then Gladys. Hey, thank you. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Quick, uh, so I was listening to all these information. It's really, really impressive. We want to move forward. Um, with something like, for example, here in Cedar Avenue, it's a long avenue and we have our neighbors on Cedric Avenue. And in order to get from Cedar Avenue to Cedric Avenue, we have to go. And I'm sorry, I'm walking outside. I'm walking my dog. Um, so running out of breath. But you have to go from one corner to the other corner. And that's almost a 20, 20 to 50 minute walk. There is this park, University Woods, that sort of have stairs and sort of like stair ramps to Cedric Avenue. But there is this area that belongs to New York State dormitory. And wondering how we can put in a request to create some sort of ramp for people that are on wheelchairs, older seniors that have issues going up the stairs because of their knees to go from Cedar Avenue to Cedric Avenue. And also to, <clears throat> we've seen a bunch of tourists try to go to the Bronx Community College for, um, I guess we see some, some statues starting there. And they always have to go around um, the block to get to Bronx Community College. So, is, would that sort of be sort of like a proposal that can be submitted for some sort of ramp up from Cedar Avenue up to Cedric Avenue? Absolutely, absolutely. I'm not sure um, what the cost estimate would be for, for something like that, but yep, we would submit that idea. Uh, the Parks Department, because it's University Woods, uh, would give us the, the sense of um, the scope of the budget. And then for something that is uh, owned by the New York State dormitory authority. It's a little bit more complex because it's a different level of government, but it's still something that we can submit and we can uh, try to work with the state on funding an improvement there. Great. That's right. And one last thing, two, two actual items is uh, one for, for sort of gates to the park. Um, I guess there were gates at one point, but that got removed. So we can get some gates to the park to close them during hectic times, at least at night. And then the other ones regarding composting. I know there's a initiative by sanitation that 
um, the other day we were downtown and it seems downtown Alliance by Battery Park is starting this program where they have sort of a compost bin just out in the public and anyone can go up with an app and plug a compost. I'm not sure if that sort of falls in the same line with a proposal uh, for composting, at least in certain sections of a district, putting those compost bins where people can just open them up anytime. Uh, the issue that many of us here have with composting is that sometimes it's on a Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. and some of us are at work and they're not on weekends. So sometimes we have to go to Manhattan to, to leave a compost. Got it. Um, yes, those are those are both ideas that that would be that we should you should submit on the on the web form because they're That's sitting right. on and yep, exactly. Um, okay, so I want to go. So now I see a lot of hands up, <laughs> which is exciting. So let's let's try to be succinct so we can get as many in here. So Iverka. Um, welcome, Councilman um, Ms. Um, Sanchez. I am Iverka Valerio. I'm the proud parent coordinator for Crescent Academy, 10X447. Actually, um, it's really down the block from you guys. We're up the block from Morris. So I wanted to welcome you, Sanchez, to our District 14. As a parent coordinator and also as a parent of myself, District 10, um, I know this is not capital, but it, when it does go with the programmatic talks, a beacon program, something for our young people. We, I know we have parks and all, but our young people have nowhere to go. And that's another different conversation. But I've been working on 181st between Crescent and Morris for 17 years, since 2005. And what I've noticed, Sanchez, is that there is no garbage cans within Morris, Creston, Walton. I mean, in the concourse, yes, but nothing from like, let's say we walk from Burnside all the way to Fordham. You can see that there's no garbage cans at all. So I'm like, I'm wondering, and I noticed like there's a lot of garbage in the floor, but then I noticed like only in the concourse on Fordham, we have garbage cans, but in between the streets, we don't have Sanchez. And like, we try to tell our young people not to throw things on the floor, but it's like, by the time you get to a garbage can, it's like literally on Fordham. And I know that that's a city thing, but I don't know if that's something that we can look within our community because it just it just breaks my heart that we have no garbage cans. We have to walk very far away to throw garbage, you know? And the third thing, I know this is not part of capital improvement, but also um, crossing guards, Sanchez. Our schools don't have crossing guards. I know that's not part of physical. That's something else different, but as, as a parent coordinator, I know my parent association asked me to bring this up to you, to your ears, that we don't have a crossing guard or a stop sign on 181st and Morris and also beacon programs. Whenever that is, if you need some um, parents to make noise and prep rally, I have the shepherd, I have other organizations is ready to rock on with you, Sanchez. I don't want to take up more time because I know we have more community members. I want to just, you know, welcome you as Dr. Miller, the principal from Crescent Academy. Welcome Sanchez to our community. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I actually live right down the block and I was I was born and raised in the neighborhood. So uh, but it's it's amazing to, to be able to work in this capacity. So um, one to answer the easy one on garbage cans. Yes, absolutely. You can submit that. Again, the important thing is to say exactly where you would propose it to be. Um, and then on the other two. So on after school programs, um, we have about 17% uh, of kids in the city of New York who are lower income children who could not, whose parents could not afford after school program, only 17% of those kids are actually able to go to an after school program. I grew up in a school, we didn't have Beacon, right? Or actually I was on the waiting list for Beacon um, at MS 45 the entire time I was in middle school, never, never had an after school program. Um, so all that to say that Absolutely, that's one of my top priorities. And thankfully, it's actually one of the mayor's top priorities to bring universal after school programming to the city of New York, um, especially, you know, you always start with a means test, uh, you, that meaning that you're starting with the, the lowest income children, those who whose parents cannot afford it. So that is something that as a council, as a new city leadership, we're gonna be working toward because when we look at all this violence, when we look at everything that's happening, you know, a big, big, big contributing factor is these foundational programs that, you know, weren't available uh, for a lot of us when we were when we were coming up. So we wanna change that uh, for, for the next generation. And, and you have my commitment to, to fight 
like crazy uh, to, to make that happen uh, with the new city leadership. Um, on the third piece, the, the crossing guards, uh, that's something that is um, an issue across not only District 14, I've heard it from you, I've heard it from MS390, you've heard it from a couple of schools now, uh, but there's actually, uh, there actually been a shortage of uh, school crossing guards um, throughout the city. Uh, they, you know, a lot of them didn't come back after uh, the pandemic, you know, school, clo school closures and all of that. Um, but you know what, you know, part of this is, is a problem with how we compensate them and how, uh, how difficult of a job it is. You work two or three hours in the morning and then two, hours in the, two or three hours in the afternoon and you get paid that much. And what are you supposed to do in the meantime? And what about the summer months? And, all, and you know, you don't get vacation off, right? So there's, there's, a, there's a problem with crossing guards um, that is a shortage citywide, but we also have to revisit how we're compensating them so we can attract folks to come and help us take care of our kids. And that's something that, that I've been talking about with the DOT and the NYPD, um, you know, and, and we'll continue to work with, with, um, with, with you on that. Uh, but knowing that it's, a, that, that it's an issue at Crescent Academy is helpful uh, because I'll come to you uh, when I need, you know, when I need the, the validation, right? They're gonna ask me, you know, what schools, where is this a challenge and all of that. So I'll be coming to you, I'll be coming yeah. to Ms. Nieves and, and my other principals. Thank you, Sanchez. Absolutely. Um, okay, I think Gladys was next. Yes, good evening. Thank you so much for the time. Uh, so my name is Gladys Gomez. I actually am one of those constituents that's all the way in the corner where the three districts meet. So 14, 15, 16. If I go one block over, I am in 14. If I go one block down, I am in 16. So I wanted to know what is the willingness in order for the three councilmen, the three council people to work together, one and two, um, the fact that you started off asking if we need a translation wins my heart over because for our CEC District 9, who I see she's actually on the call, our president is actually full Spanish speaking. So not only is that a huge merit, but it's not often seen in spaces like these where we're offered translation. So one, I would like to yield the rest of my time to her in order for her to introduce herself. And I do tend to talk a lot, but I did go ahead and write and love to be in communication with your office to uh, further see some of these um, ideas that we have. But I do go ahead and yield the rest of my time to Ms. Aide Sainos Flores. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Aide, ¿quiere decir algo? Aide Sainos Flores. Give her a second. Okay, well, um, so so just as, as a follow-up item, thank you so much. Um, I, I really appreciate that question. So one, uh, we have an amazing relationship, um, you know, starting off with all of the council members. Just today, I was at the boundary of uh, District 14 and 11, uh, which, which intersect in the north. Um, Althea, Stevens, and I intersect in the south, and then all along Grand Concourse, I'm intersecting with uh, council member Oswald Felice. So absolutely, yes, uh, we are going to join forces um, on some funding initiatives. We're going to join forces in our advocacy. Um, it's, it's a really beautiful thing, and we're going to try to maintain that. Um, so yes, want to want to definitely lift that up and then second to your point about language access so i am going to as soon as we hop off here i'm going to redo this presentation in spanish on facebook live and i'm going to post it in spanish um, with uh you know just just right after this so that everybody uh, can can see that uh, who needs to so la, la presentación que hice hoy día esta noche eh, enseguida cerremos aquí la voy a subir en español a Facebook Live so si la quieren ver de nuevo en español la pueden ver y claro estamos aquí para responder cualquier pregunta que tengan okay so I'm hearing my, my team is telling me I get to pick one more question but team I need you to tell me which which hand uh, to, to pick uh, because I don't know who which who's first <laughs> So I was actually saying that this is going to be the last question because we do have to wrap up and uh, just respect everybody's time. Uh, but I did add the link um, on the chat so that we can uh, be able to collect all of the ideas. Unless Miss Ivis Sinos is able to um, unmute herself so we can give her some time. But if not, unfortunately, we do have to wrap up. Um, but the link is on. So, um, Miss Ides, okay, 
All right. Well, just, okay. just before we wrap, I just want to take a moment and thank you all so much for hopping on. Uh, the team and I, we didn't know uh, what turnout would look like, but we had about 25 people on the Zoom um, and we have some like 20 or 30. Well, during the course of the conversation, we had some 20 or so folks on the Facebook Live and we're also on BronxNet. So this is great. I'm so excited <laughs> to see so many folks on here. This is only the beginning. You know, we got to build our capacity capacity as a community. We got to come together. We have to know each other. We have to know who to call and who to, who to yell at. Um, and my other elected officials, uh, when, when things are going wrong, that's, that's what we're here for. So just before we wrap, I want to uh, just acknowledge a few folks that didn't have a chance to speak. Uh, Ms. Taisha, who is the president of the Tenant Association at Bailey Houses, one of our NYCHA developments. Uh, Ms. Carrie, who is president of Community Garden on 181st Street and Morris. Um, Mr. Mr. Kayborn, who is a peace activist in our community, who puts out amazing music and inspires our youth uh, to, to put the guns away and, and to, to really be the best versions of themselves. Thank you so much, Kayborn, for everything that you do. Uh, Mr. Haley, who's a long, long, long time activist in District 14 um, and is, is currently the leader of a nonprofit organization. Thank you for everything that you do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to miss out on uh, uh, some others. You know, those, those of you who spoke, uh, Victor, who is the, the president of our Block Association on Cedar Avenue, and just everyone here, just thank you for everything that you do. Uh, I want you all not just to know me, but to know each other, uh, because what we need to do is we need to, we need to build, build our fabric, build our relationship, uh, and that is what is going to allow us to be resilient when, when people come and they say, oh, no, there wasn't enough funding for District 14, or you know what, something went wrong. There, God, God, God forbid there was a fire or there was, you know, something there was there was a, sh a shooting which we did have about a month ago a fatal shooting on aqueduct right. We, we, we have to come together and we have to do things together. And it really starts with, with these kind of spaces where, where we're activating together. So last thing is we are open. The office is open, um, but we are under construction. Uh, you can probably see that all the shelves are empty behind me. <laughs> so it's kind of like a straw space. So we're going to be reconstructing the office. I look forward to the grand open opening with all of you. Um, in the meantime, um, please call us. Uh, we'll put the phone number in the chat and email us. And my team is almost, almost on fully on board, not, not quite 100%, uh, but we're almost there. And uh, we're, we're here to, to respond to the community and, and be here for y'all. So thank you so much, everybody.